Today's reading is from Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 13. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of my serv servant Jacob of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, People may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. You heavens above, rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but pot shards among the pot shards on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Woe to the one who says to a father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought to birth? This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its maker. Concerning things to come, do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hand stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry host. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. You got a lot of kids. I hear a lot of voices. <laughs> I think that's the main reason why. No, I just want them. <laughs> Go. You got no Lexi or Lena either, right? Well, if we hear Sherry yell from downstairs, we know she needs help. <laughs> She's got a lot of them. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father, as we hear the children's laughter, Lord, help us to remember that children are a blessing and heritage from the Lord. That you, before sin ever came into this world, established that it, it was for man to not be alone, that you created the institution of marriage and the ability to have children and father it is our responsibility to raise up these children to know you and lord sometimes we act like we don't know you because we are so much like the world rather than like christ in this world so father i pray that you open our eyes and ears to hear your words lord not only to hear them but to 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 obey lord to find the peace the shalom that you want us to have to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven and the fact that we have been given some of the answers to those mysteries, Lord, that we've been given the good news of Jesus Christ to spread to this world, not just to spread the gospel message, but to live it so that others will see and others will ask about the lives that we live and we can tell them about Jesus Christ. Father, I just thank you for the freedom that we do have to come and study your word, Lord, that we have in so many various um, ways that we can read it available to us today and we do it without persecution so let us not take that for granted lord but help us to be sanctified by your truth and by your spirit to be different to be set apart in this world to be a light to this world until jesus returns we pray this in jesus name amen so i entitled this wheel or woe 
Do you know what that means? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe that's not familiar to you. And the reason that I picked that passage from um, Isaiah, I think where it was from, is the new, I'll get it to it in a minute, I'm not sure which one it is, it says will or woe in one of the verses. Do you know what that means? You know what woe means, okay? You don't know what will means. All right, how about blessing and cursing? Do you understand that? Do you understand good fortune and bad fortune? Will would be that translation of, of blessing. And the reason I get, get that uh, translation is because I want to talk more about it so that we understand that. Because we understand that blessings come from God. But we don't like to say that cursings come from God. Oh, don't throw stones at me yet. Read your Bible and everything. Because God is against the sinners. God says to choose this day what you will, who you will serve. The God of, of Israel or the God of the Amorites and the Hittites. Choose today blessings or cursings. Choose life or death. But we like to think of God as always for us. He is for His children. He wants the best for His children. He disciplines His children so that we know that we are His children. But God is in complete control if you read the verses that, that Mark read this morning. And He raised up a pagan king to change the world, to set Israel free, to, to bring her back to her home country, to rebuild the temple, and to bring about justice in the known world at that day. If you study about Cyrus, known as Cyrus the Great, you'll see all the things that he did for humankind, and he was a pagan king. God uses everyone for his glory. Look how he used Pharaoh, the king, instead. Look how he used Nebuchadnezzar, and he gave Nebuchadnezzar a chance to change, but Nebuchadnezzar was focused on the things of this world. You and I are called to be like Christ if you have accepted that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the chosen one, that he has offered forgiveness for sins by his death on the cross, and he shows you the fact by his resurrection that you will have eternal life. You are holy, sanctified, set apart, a group of holy priests offering spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing to God. It is your reasonable service. So I've got to ask myself, and you should be doing the same, am I doing that? Or am I just living my part in this world? Treading along, saying that I am like Jesus in this world, but when others see me, do they see Jesus in this world? For many, many years before Isaiah prophesied that, which happened about 150 years before Cyrus came along, you read in the Old Testament of God warning His children constantly to turn back to Him, to repent, to change their ways. But instead, they long for the things of this world. The story wasn't any, any new thing then. It went all the way back to just right after the children of Israel left Egypt. They longingly looked back and said, Why have you brought us out here in the desert to die? Who is this guy? Who is this guy, Moses? And they longed to go back to be enslaved by the sins, by the enticements of this world. But God is faithful and He wants to bless His children. And just as Isaiah prophesied, they did go into uh, slavery in Babylon. And this man, Cyrus the Great, was responsible for helping bring them back. And he is not recognized in Scripture as a saved man. He is recognized as a pagan king that God uses to bring about his justice, to fight the wrongs of the poor, the, the crippled, the lame, those that are le they're the least of. In Deuteronomy 28, we read, Now, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God and are careful to follow His commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. The NIV doesn't have that overtake you part. They won't just come upon you. They'll pursue you. If you've ever read Psalm 23, I'm not sure which version that is, that... that mercy and grace pursues you all of your life. That's what God wants for you. His blessings will come upon you and literally overtake you, pounce upon you, tackle you. Wow. God is so good. 
If you'll obey the voice of the Lord your God, you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. Are you seeing a pattern here of blessings rather than woes? As well as the produce of your land and the offspring of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flock. Your baskets and kneading bowl will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. I don't know about you, but that sounds like the way I want it to be. Right? Well, we're going to fast forward to Luke 6 here in a minute, and things are going to change some in what you say in perspective. Because Jesus tells us constantly in the Scriptures that the least of these will inherit the kingdom of heaven. That, that what you see now will be flipped upside down, so to speak, and you're supposed to live for the kingdom rather than these blessings that you have here today. Who would not want to be popular, spoken well of, in good health, fed, have riches today? But Jesus turns that upside down. But remember, God wants to bless His children, never to woe them or to curse them. But there's a choice involved. And all throughout history, God's children have chosen incorrectly. They've chosen the lust of the flesh, the longings for the satisfaction now, rather than fixing their eyes on things eternal. And we as Christians are supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And without faith, it's, it's impossible to please God. And He graciously rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, Isaiah 45, 7, that's the verse that I'm talking about. The NIV says it this way. I form the light and create darkness. We know God is the creator of all things. I bring prosperity and create disaster. Is God bad? No, He's not bad. He's good. But He uses the things of this world, the sin that is in this world, to bring about His will, His way. I, the Lord, do all these things. Pretty clear who does some of these things. Now, good things happen, bad things happen, but God directs everything and controls everything. He is sovereign. And we don't think that way all the time because when calamity happens to us, we don't want to think He's sovereign anymore, that He's forgot about us or whatever. And Satan leaps in and says not to trust God, that He's turned His back on you. But Scripture is clear. God is in complete control. He loves you, wants your blessings for you, but you don't know the long-term thing unless you're fixing your eyes on things above. And Jesus will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no more suffering, everything else. That will be then if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 45, 7 from the New Living Translation. I create light and I make the darkness. I send good times and bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. King James Version, I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. That one's rough. I, the Lord, do all these things. The New American Standard Version, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating disaster. I, the Lord, who do all these things. We've got different words here for what these things are, but it is the Lord who does all of these things. He's in complete control of creation and everything that goes on in His creation. New Revised Standard Version. I form light and create darkness. I make will and I create woe. Do you understand it a little better now? I, the Lord, do all these things. So do you understand who God is? Do you understand His sovereignty, His power, His holiness, and the fact that He created you and gave you a choice whether to worship Him, give Him honor and thanks or not? As a Christian and as a pagan, the choices are still the same. He loves everyone and he loves and adores you are beloved if you are his child and he wants the best for you as we read on a couple chapters later in De Deuteronomy Deuteronomy chapter 30 now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach it is not up in heaven so that you may ask who will ascend into heaven and get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it nor it is beyond the sea, so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us, so that we may obey it. No, the, Lord, the, word, no, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, 
so you may obey it. Are you seeing a pattern here? And that's obedience to God. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in obedience to Him and keep His commands. That looks different than what the world looks like. Even down to the TV shows you watch, even to the places that you frequent, and especially in how you fight injustice in this world. We are called to make a difference, just like God raised up Cyrus the Great, and he was a great humanitarian for the world. Whoever he conquered, he made their lives of the people better, and he was a pagan king. To walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, his decrees and his laws, then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are to enter and possess. But if your heart turns away and, and you are not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, which we never want to admit we do that, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you're crossing, the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, will and woe. Now choose life that you and your children may live. You and your children. All that laughter that you heard, all that noise that you heard, your heritage and your blessing from God will follow in your path more than likely. So how much are you like Christ? Are you just reading the Sunday school stories to them and stuff? Are you living like Christ lived in this world? That's a big, big difference. God gives you a choice. He says it's not far from you. He gave you a new heart, a heart of flesh, so that it's moldable and everything. His words are written upon your heart. You have the Holy Spirit with you each and every step of the way, empowering you, giving you gifts, talents, and abilities to serve Him. And what good father, if you pray frequently, if you keep knocking, if you keep asking, won't give good gifts, and how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to help you in this world to be like Christ, not like everyone else? Because if you're like everyone else, that means there's darkness rather than light shining in this world. And what a pitiful group of people we are that call ourselves Christians. You have professed with your mouth and believed with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore you're saved. Romans 10, 9 makes that clear. You're born again. You're a new creation in Jesus Christ. That is the case, right? Are you that new creation? Are you growing and maturing? It's a shame that Paul has to write, you know, I wanted to teach you so much more, but you're still infants. You're still sucking on a bottle. None of those little kids sucked on a bottle anymore. They're growing up. And they're growing up to be individuals in this world that will make a difference and be like Christ or not. And part of, the, part of that is going to be how they've been trained up. Whether you're writing it on the doorpost of your houses, if you're talking about God when you get up, when you go to bed, when you go about, and whether you're living like Jesus in this world. And God set a choice before you, will or woe. Blessing or cursing, life or death. So which one do you choose? Pretty simple which one I should choose, but which one do I choose each and every day? From history, again, God's children repeatedly chose woe. Woe, woe, woe. 150 years before it happened, Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus the Great would come in, that he would set the captives free, and that he would, he would do things, but he didn't, didn't prophesy so much that, that history literally tells us that Cyrus did. He literally conquered the world and changed it for good in that time. Now think, forward, fast forward 500 years, however long it is, to Jesus Christ, and the Romans conquered the world and what they taught the world. There was complete darkness. And just at the right time, Jesus Christ came, born of flesh and blood to lay down His life so that you wouldn't have to, to pay the price. 
In Isaiah 45, verse 6, it says, So that from the rising sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. That is why Cyrus the Great was raised up to change the world for the better. And he didn't profess to be a Christian. I know that the term wasn't there then. I am the Lord, there is no other. I am the one that forms light and creates darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And he will use you, whether you're obedient to him or not, to bring about his purpose. But wouldn't you much rather be obedient? Wouldn't you much rather have the blessings? And oh, didn't that scripture say that my children will be blessed also? I've got to stand on that promise, period. I have to stand on that promise from Hebrews that Noah condemned the world. He was a preacher of righteousness and he built an ark not knowing how long what this was going to be anything else. And then that last prepositional phrase at the end of it, to save his family. Yeah, I get up here and preach for you guys. I do, but I preach so much more for them. I'm sorry, but I do because they're my heritage. I love them and I love you but I will do everything I can to save my family. They're going to be the first ones I want to put on the boat. Period. In Luke chapter 6, we left off with Jesus appointed 12 out of the however many disciples at the time. Those that understood that they had left the world behind to follow Jesus. Now, maybe they didn't have as much to give up. Maybe they were poor. Maybe that's why they understood better. They were captives because they were held by the, the Roman Empire. They wanted to see justice, but they didn't know that justice was going to come by denying themselves, taking up their cross, and following after Jesus. That's why so many departed from Him. Read John chapter 6 when Jesus said, All you come to me for is that you want physical needs met. You want bread now so that you don't hunger. And I'm offering you the bread of eternal life, living water, where you'll never thirst, you'll never be hungry, where you'll have eternal salvation, forgiveness of sin, and you'll be a child of God with everything that the kingdom will be yours as a child. But do you accept this? Were you willing to leave this world behind? No wonder it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle because you've got more that you think you're giving up. And in this country, we are rich. We are blessed from a world standard. You've got everything you want. You never have hungered. You never have thirst. Maybe some of you think you have, but have you really hungered? Not knowing where your next meal period was coming from? Not having anything whatsoever? that your body was going through withdrawals because of hunger, that you were so, th so thirsty that your mouth was parched that you couldn't speak, but yet we're supposed to hunger and thirst for righteousness. So he pointed these 12 apostles and he tells them, I'm going to flip your world upside down because everything you think you're living for is not necessarily so. So I'm in Luke chapter 6 and I'm going to read till the end of the red letters. <laughs> So you can hear Jesus' sermon on the plain here or the sermon on the level ground where he put it all out there on level ground. He made it pretty clear. This is the way you're supposed to live if you're going to come and follow after me or not. Okay, and don't get it confused with the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably not the same because you can look at Scripture. You can look at when it happened. It could be that Jesus was on the mountain and went down to a level place and then, then preached, but more than likely it's a different time. But we can look at Matthew's account and get more insight, but we want to take it from Luke's perspective again. So that's why I'm preaching through Luke this way and what he's written so far. And think of the things that he has, has written. I'm starting in verse 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. 
Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Now I'm going to stop right here and just interject for a second. That's not what I think I would have signed up for. Do you think it's what they thought they would have signed up for? Probably they understood some of this, but not to this point. He said, if you want to follow me, this is literal, guys. You've got to deny everything that you know. This is literal. We, pre we preach this all the time. But it's you've got to deny everything about yourself because Jesus is king, not you. He saved you from your sins. You've got to take up your cross. And in Luke's version, it says daily again, every single day, and then follow after Jesus. You've been forever changed. Everything that you thought was important before, as Paul says, is lost. It's garbage. And what do you do with garbage? You make sure you don't hold on to it. You throw it in the garbage bin. Okay? Oh. But, woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good things to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do we do these things? This is a continuation of this. If someone slaps you on your cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. I look more like a sinner here. I don't know about you. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get back anything. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will be, not be judged. Do not con condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Verse 39, he also told them this parable, this further teaching illustration that maybe not everyone's going to get, but if you're in tune to God, he is going to be revealing this to you because Jesus said, I teach in parables so others might not understand, but you have the ability to understand this. Can the blind lead the blind? Has Jesus taken and put salve on your eyes and healed your blindness? Can you see now that the implications of the kingdom of heaven, what Jesus Christ has done for you, and how he's calling you to live? <clears throat> Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit then? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? You can, how can you say to your brother... Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourselves fail to see the plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The mo moment the torment, torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. 
Now let me remind you how that started. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A crowd of his disciples was there. We don't know how many, but we know the 12 were there because he had just chosen them. And we know what happens to one of them. There was also a great number of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, coastal regions of Tyre and Sidon. 50 mile radius coming to see Jesus because we've got to see the, all these rumors that we've heard to figure out who this person is. And Luke has clearly presented who he is. He is the Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the King of Kings. He is the Chosen One. Who is He to you? They had came to hear Him and be healed of their diseases, what they wanted to get from God, not what they wanted to give to God. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them. There's the scene that is set. And then verse 20 says, Looking at his disciples, he said, longingly, compassionately, looking at his own, those who had said that they would follow him, he presented this message. Do you live this message? This is who you've said you are. You've professed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then you should study this passage and study this passage and pray to God that you can become more like this rather than the woes that are in here. Because if you sit down and put them on a, on a chart and mark which ones you are, probably you're not going to like the outcome because you look more like the devil than you look like Jesus. And that's exactly what the world will see. That's exactly what your children will see. And you're choosing woes instead of blessings. This teaching is similar to the Sermon on the Mount, which you'll find in Matthew chapter 5 to 17. But like I presented it to you, it, it's probably a different place. And if you've heard a sermon from me today, you will hear say, oh, he said that before in a sermon. It's quite, com quite common for that to be the place. And Jesus is telling his disciples here, as Luke has painted this picture for you so far, what's going on, and they've been called into ministry now. And he says, wait a minute, let me tell you what you signed up for. Are you sure you want to sign up for this? He teaches them who will listen about the kingdom of God. There were crowds of people there that wanted to be healed. There were also the Pharisees there. We know that. There were also crowds of disciples that said, I want to follow after Jesus. Crowds. I don't know what the number again is. I know there's 12 that were, that were called aside Jesus to be apostles. Oh, let's say there was 120 total disciples. That's 10 times the people that truly are going to be committed to God versus aren't. Let's say there's 500. How many times is that? Oh, let's look at the church today. And I've heard the phrase before that 10% of the work in the church is done, or 90% of the work done in church is done by 10% of the people. Is that true? I mean, there's some truth to it for sure. Because there are many that profess, but not many that want to take up the mantle of what a disciple looks like. And let me remind you again that Jesus calls you a disciple. It was not until Antioch that we were, that we were called Christians because we were truly living differently than the rest of the world. So much that Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was sent by the twelve to say, what's going on in Antioch? Because we've never seen this before. Be they're truly living like Christ there. You've got to go see this. And then he's so excited he goes to get Saul and show Saul. And maybe that's what got him so psyched up that he wanted to go all, all over the world and preach the gospel message. I don't know. But Luke has set this stage and he's put it in your lap and said, Blessed are you. Read Matthew's account. It says, blessed are. Luke makes it personal. Blessed is Alan when he's poor. Well, that's kind of hard to fathom, kind of hard to accept. But as you study Scripture, you'll understand that because like you say, I don't want to have these other gods before me. Now, but, but God, if you've made me rich, then what can I do with it? I certainly don't want to build storehouses for myself and then my life be required. I want to be generous for others with what you have given me and be a blessing to bring comfort to others because you've comforted me.
both sermons in Matthew and Luke start with blessed. Blessed. Don't you want to be blessed? If you study that word more again, it means that you're in a right standing with God. It doesn't mean what your immediate uh, position is. Ah, right now, I'm, I'm, everything's great. Right now, there's not. I'm facing cancer. Right now, this is going on in my life. Right now, I'm poor. I'm hungry. I'm, people speak bad of me. But I know that my overall standing is I'm a child of God and no one can take away my joy. They can't take that from me. If they persecute me to even death, I fear the one who has authority to throw my soul into hell and I am okay. I am in right standing with Him. I am blessed. And that's how the sermon starts. Matthew records eight beatitudes. Luke only records four. But the four he does sets the stage for what the disciples' lives are going to look like if that's what they really want to do, if they want to accept this call. In the NIV, in, in Luke 20, it says, Blessed are you who are poor. Matthew says in spirit. You might have realized that already. For yours is the kingdom of God. But Luke here is talking more to these 12 disciples. It says, you're going to be poor. You might have thought you were poor already because the Roman government taxes you so much. Probably Matthew is the only one who understands what it's like to be rich in this world because he sold his soul to the devil, right? But he realized that the Messiah has come and he changed his mind. So blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. No matter how poor or impoverished you are, yours is the kingdom of God. Of God. You are a citizen, you are a child of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now, personal again, but Matthew's account says, and thirst for righteousness. You will be satisfied or filled. Because there are going to be times now when the disciples went out and Jesus tells them, Don't take anything to eat, rely on what I provide for you, rely on daily bread. Blessed are you who weep now or mourn, for you will laugh or be comforted. What are you mourning for? Or what are you sad about? Well, they're not sad because they know the kingdom of God. They are sad because they know the state of their brothers and sisters who don't understand this, who will die in their sins. So is this why you weep or do you weep more for, like I said, this is happening to me today, so I'm not really concerned about my brother and sister over here that are dying in their sins. I'm concerned about this today. I've got to focus on this day. It's, it's cancer that I have or whatever it is, and I've got to focus on this. It only makes sense. Well, that's fine. Focus on it, but don't forget about your brother. Weep and mourn for them. That might be the time that you can pray even more because you've been stopped from your regular deeds. I don't know the answer to that, but I know God is in control of all things. He creates those things to guide you to worship Him. Blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, or persecute you, insult you, and reject your name as evil. Why? Not because you did this or that, but because of the Son of Man. Because you believe what Daniel prophesied, that Jesus Christ is the one, that there is no other, there is no other way, there is no other truth, there is no other life, and no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And because you believe that, you act differently, and people will persecute you, they will hate you, they will ridicule you. And in the case of the disciples, they will execute you for your faith. This is what you're signing up for. I want to remind you what happened so far in Luke so you can see this picture again where we started because we started after Jesus' temptation and went from there. He was rejected in Nazareth, right? Oh, yeah, when he was accepted in Capernaum. Okay, some will reject, some will accept. Remember in Nazareth, though, they tried to kill him. <laughs> Capernaum they were happy to see because he cast out a demon from church again. Don't forget that. It was in the service. He had authority over demons. He had authority over diseases. All kind of people came to him. When he healed Peter's mother-in-law, she got up and served. All kind of people came and wanted to be healed, and he healed them all into the wee hours of the morning. He had authority over fish to come into the net when they cast out the net to teach them that they would be fishers of men. He has authority over you, but you have a choice whether you're going to be a fisher of men or not, though, right? Hmm. He gives mercy and compassion 
to someone no one even look at, the leper. He gave forgiveness of sins which, just, which riled the religious leaders when the, the people that brought the man to, to Jesus never expected forgiveness of sin. They were just looking for the momentary again for, for a healing. And then he calls a tax collector. Boy, this is a significant word we put Matthew in here. Oh, if he could be a tax collector, how many of us could put our names in that spot in this scripture? I'm serious. Because you've got so many riches in this world, you work for the things that you want, for the good things in life. It's the American dream now. The American dream isn't anymore to, pro to, to seek God and to be able to worship Him in freedom. It's to go seek your own desires and create your own personal wealth. And it's gotten to the point where it's, I want it now. I don't want to do anything for it. I want it all now. So how many of us are like that tax collector who when Jesus said, come follow me, he walked away from that tax collector's booth and never looked back and knew that it would probably cost him his life. Then we read about feasting instead of fasting because the religious were so caught up in, well, we need to fast now. And Jesus said, no, we need to feast now for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. It's a time for new wine, a time for celebration. John's first miracle is, is Jesus turning water into wine at the, at the marriage ceremony. The Son of Man has come and He is even Lord of the Sabbath. And it is, is it appropriate on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? So then 12 are called to step out from the crowds to be different. But even the crowd of disciples don't necessarily look different, do they? Because many profess, but not many put on the mantle and follow into Jesus' footsteps. So then we have verse 20. We're looking at his disciples, longingly looked, looking at them. He said, blessed are you when you are poor because you've given up the world to come and follow me. That young rich ruler that came eagerly to Jesus and the disciples probably looked at him and said, oh, here's a good candidate. He wasn't willing to sell everything that he had and follow Jesus because he loved money more than he loved Jesus. Oh, what was his question? Oh, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So does that mean that he walked away from eternal life that day? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. I cannot imagine what Matthew was sitting there thinking at that point. I think he was going, I understand. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Do you understand this? Because if you're poor, it's going to lead to hunger, isn't it? Because if you're really, really poor, you're not going to know where your next meal is going to come from. You can pray that prayer and ask God for daily bread and understand what it means. If you're truly poor. So we've got a definition of how poor poor is when Jesus says the number two blessing. Blessed are you who hunger now. I wasn't just talking about being poor, Matthew. I was talking about being dirt poor. Are you really, really ready to accept this? You had all the luxuries of life, and yeah, your people talked bad about you, but other people talked good about you, and you partied with all your friends and everything. You had a good life, but now not only are you going to be poor, you're not going to know where your next meal comes from. But don't worry, for you will be satisfied. Blessing number three, blessed are you who weep now. I said before, you've got to ask yourself what you weep over. Because Matthew wasn't weeping that he was poor and that he was hungry. He was weeping because of his sin. That's why he could walk away from the riches, from his tax collector's booth. He knew what Jesus was offering him. He knew that he was the Messiah, the one that had the words of eternal life. He knew that nothing no matter what he gained on this earth, could offset the cost of his soul. He knew what profited him, and that was to seek and to follow after Jesus and Jesus alone. Don't worry, Matthew. You're weeping now, but you will laugh. You will rejoice. Number four, blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. <laughs> Matthew again. I'm taking him because that's how Lucas wrote this so far. 
you know, he was betrayed, he betrayed his own people, and now he's back. What are they saying about him? Now what's, what's the Roman government say about him? No one was probably talking good about Matthew. Now here's one of the 12 that's a, that's a zealot that wants to go out with a dagger in and kill anybody that's on the opposing team, and Matthew's sitting right here. Is he waiting for time to stab Matthew? Because Matthew's flipped from one to the other. What, what's what Matthew going to do next? And all of this is because Matthew chose the Son of Man. So what, is, what does Jesus tell Matthew to do next, if we're looking at it that way? Rejoice in that day. Get up and do it a happy dance. Oh, maybe your, your translation has happy are you instead of blessed. I, I guess that's okay, but happy is such a watered down word because happy is based on my circumstance again. Blessed is so much more than happy because like I said, I know what my eternal destination is. My eternal hope is. Rejoice in that day. It will happen in that day. You don't know when that day will happen, but you're supposed to be watching and ready and dressed and serving and even leap for joy. How many Christians leap for joy? Most of them look like this. I'm a Christian. Smile. Leap for joy. Let the world know the hope that you have. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. This is a topic, I'm not going to get too far in it, but that a lot of people avoid teaching because they don't teach the rewards. Read your Bible. The more you give up, the more you'll be rewarded, to put it, simply put it. The twelve disciples, Peter said, well, we've given up everything to follow you, Lord. What about us? And he said, you'll be given a hundredfold and then eternal life. And then we read that their names will be written on the pillars of the kingdom. That's recognition. I don't know what the rewards will look like, anything else. But I know that I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, what do you do? You become the least of these in the kingdom of earth. Not just a reward in heaven, but great is your reward in heaven. For that is <clears throat> how they treated the prophets. Go to Hebrews 11, look at that Hall of Faith chapter and see what happened to all the different prophets. They were sawn in half, they were killed, they were, they were put on a pole, they were beheaded because they brought about will or woe. Choose God's blessings or choose His cursings. Which one do you want? That was their message. Repent and turn to God. It wasn't a message of no hope. It wasn't a message that they shouldn't have followed. It was a message of here's what you're doing. Examine yourself and turn to God or turn to your worthless idols. And they continued to turn to their worthless idols over and over and over again. You know them as the Beatitudes. I believe that's the Latin word. Jesus is presenting the qualities of a blessed life here on earth and for all eternity. But are you willing to take the blessings that He's calling blessings, poor, hungry, weeping, mocked, laughed at, persecuted, are you willing to take those blessings? He called them blessings. To have eternal blessings that will be great for you doing that, for being obedient. Or will you choose to live opposite and choose to be woed or cursed? Supreme happiness or happiness for a day? Just as in the days of Cyrus, Jesus is calling you to make a difference. That's what He's calling the disciples to do. They preach the gospel message, but they set the captives free, not just spiritually, but they fight disease. They fight hunger. They fight people that are marginalized and oppressed. They fight the injustices of this world, just as Cyrus the Great did. So now I have to ask myself, how am I doing that? Am I only preaching the gospel? How do I view the poor? And Scripture is clear about the poor, and we argue that as even Christians. They are poor because of their circumstances. They just happen. They're poor because they're widowed or orphaned. They're poor because of slothfulness or laziness. Now I've got to examine this one, okay? I got to, and I've got to help them get out of that, but does it still mean that I don't help them? 
because I still in the Old Testament we leave part of our, our harvest for those who will get off of their butt and go get it. It's there for them. You just got to go. So you still might have to go to them and say, here's the circumstances you're in, but do you have the weeping for their souls? Or do you just condemn them because they are slothful or the position that they're in? Blessed are you or woe are you. You have a choice. Isaiah 45, 7 <clears throat> says, God is the one of blessings or will and the one of judgment or woes. But the biggest woe comes not in this life, does it? It comes when you get into heaven and you think you've got the proper attire on and Jesus says, Take that one out of here. He doesn't belong here. Oh, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth then. Everyone likes the stories. Don't we like the stories that's called Happily Ever After? Yeah. Don't you like those stories? Yeah. yeah, those are... Go sit down, baby. Those are fairy tales, right? Yeah. Well, thank you. Jesus is not presenting a fairy tale here. He's saying if you want to live happily ever after... Live for me now. If it takes being poor, if it takes being hungry, if it takes weeping, if it takes insulting, because great will your reward be in heaven. So maybe I should put more thought to these things that Jesus is teaching. Maybe it should not only take thought, but take action. Because actions speak louder than words, right? Right? Maybe I should think more about eternal blessings rather than earthly pleasures. The challenge of the Beatitudes is this. Will you be blessed in the world's way or in Christ's way? That's the challenge. You have the choice. Do you want earthly blessings or will you sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow Jesus? Will you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus? Will you choose to be poor hungry, weeping, and just all out miserable, will you choose that and know that you have the kingdom of heaven? Or will you hold on to other gods that you don't want to admit that you're holding on to? The life you choose to live as a, as a Christian is the only heaven that some will ever see. You ever thought about that? The life that you live, not what you profess, the life that you live is the only heaven that some will ever see. And here's the thing that Jesus says, if you live that way, don't worry, you will never see hell. And maybe they won't either because you chose to live that way. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that... Luke gave up everything as a physician, that he gave up the money and the prestige that he would have and <laughs> healed Paul's wound so that he could go on because he considered everything garbage and rubbish except for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, for taking his time and effort to, to train people up so that they would not fall from the faith but live the faith. Oh, Father, help us to hear the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord to know the power of the Spirit and the power of Jesus' resurrection in our life, to not just be someone who talks about Jesus or goes to church, but to be one that fights the injustice of this world, to live differently, that doesn't have any other gods before you, but lays them all down at the feet of Jesus. For us who are rich, Father, which is, is us in America, help us not to use our riches for our own glory or our own gain, but to use them to bring about the kingdom. Lord, teach us how to be more like Jesus Christ. And Father, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and long for His return. To hear Him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing our closing songs.